introduction. Um, so our first speaker this morning is Benjamin Mako Hill, known to most of us by the awesome nickname Mako. Um, he's the assistant professor in the Department of Communication at the University of Washington. He's a faculty affiliate at Harvard's Berkman Center for Internet and Society, and also at Harvard's Institute for Quantitative Social Science. Uh, basically, he studies and participates in peer production from a variety of different angles. And his free software achievements are numerous. He's an FSF board member. He has written software. He has written books. He's also on the board of directors of the Wikimedia Foundation. And when I asked him how many Libre Planets he had come to, he said he's come to all of them. <laughs> and member meetings before that. Um, personally, I really appreciate his infectious enthusiasm for free software and his eagerness to explain it and why it's important. I think that helped me get my bearings when I was new in the free software movement. And there's probably lots of other people here who can say the same thing. So thank you for that. Um, and without any more introductions, he's going to talk about access without empowerment. Mako. Cool. Great. Well, uh, thank you all so much. And thank you for that awesome introduction. As someone who is, in many ways, really grown up in this community, I mean, also at Libra Planets, as I've been coming for a long time, uh, and who's had, I've had my beliefs about the world and about free software shaped by a lot of the work and writing and conversations with people in this room, it was an unbelievable honor for me to be asked to give a keynote here. And I'm uh, thrilled to be able to do so. I have a little bit of a provocative title today, um, Access Without Empowerment. Um, and I'll walk you through a little bit about what it is that I'm going to try to do today. I'm going to, uh, you know, I, I, this, is, this is something that I've been thinking about and reflecting on a lot for the last year, or year, year and a half or so. Um, um, I spend a lot of time thinking about free software's mission as someone sort of on the board of director of the FSF. Um, and I'm going to talk about how I have, I have recently been thinking about this mission in sort of in terms of two parts, this idea of access and this idea of empowerment. I'll try to provide a little bit of context and talk about why those missions, uh, those, those two parts, those twin missions are important right now, in, uh, increasingly important now. I'm then going to sort of give a little bit of a progress report. I'm going to try to walk through those two missions and talk about how I think we're doing in terms of those two things. I'm going to suggest that in terms of access, we're doing well, very well, um, and mm -hmm. along most dimensions getting better. Um, and that in terms of empowerment, although we're not doing poorly in terms of spreading empowerment, we're doing less well and not improving to the same degree. I'm going to talk about why we've had these mixed results, or what I'm going to suggest are very mixed results in terms of these ways, and talk about the systematic ways in which our advocacy and which our movement has uh, worked in a way that privileges or makes access uh, success in terms of providing access more easy than providing um, than empowering, which is in the way in which I'm talking about it. And then I'm going to talk about some strategies for the future. So. So uh, uh, hopefully provide a little bit of um, uh, framing. And I think that there's lots of connections between, uh, hopefully, between what I'm um, talking about here and some of the things I've seen in the other sessions and a lot of the conversations other people are having here as well. All right. So like, uh, because I have to, perhaps, we'll start with the free software definition. Um, I don't have the notes here, but I can, I've done this so many times that I, like many of you, can uh, sort of repeat this in my sleep. And, uh, and uh, the free software, but the free software definition, of course, contains the four freedoms, numbered starting from zero because we're and that's funny uh, to us. Uh, when I speak to academics about this, people like don't get that. I'm like, trust me, it's really funny. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and recursive acronyms, also very funny. Um, uh, uh, but, but of course, freedom zero is the freedom to uh, use the program for any purpose. Um, freedom, uh, the first freedom is the freedom to um, study uh, this is the study of the program to understand how it works, to look at the source code, to uh, to work on it in that sense. Freedom uh, one is the freedom to uh, to sorry. Freedom two is the freedom to redistribute copies so we can help people to share widely. And of course, um, freedom three is the is the, the the fourth freedom is the freedom to uh, collaborate with other people to work together to uh, to to build software as a community and to share our improvements more widely. But as I suggested, I really think of these, um, I can sort of split these down into, into two sort of 
two freedoms, or maybe not two freedoms, but two, two types of freedoms. Um, the first is fundamentally about access, and sort of uh, um, on the anniversary of the, the GNU Manifesto, we can look back to the, our initial sort of founding documents that talk about this. Um, the GNU Manifesto says, I consider the golden rule requires that if, I like to, that if I like a program, I must share it with other people who like it. Software sellers want to divide users and conquer them, making each user agree not to share with others. I refuse to break solidarity with users in this way. We can think of uh, this idea, the idea of um, sharing or sort of access as an, as, as an important freedom at the core of our movement. But in many ways, this idea that sharing is good because sharing is something that is good is actually kind of the, the, the weak form of this argument. There's a much stronger form that other people within our community have made, which I found very influential. Uh, Eben Moglen has talked about the fact that free software, like lots of other kinds of information goods, has what, what is called zero marginal cost, which essentially means that if I produce a piece of software, it may take me time and effort to do so. But once I've produced it, anyone, in fact, everyone, everywhere can have that software for the same amount of time and effort that it took me to make that software in the first place, right? Um, if, as Eben says, we could make food in the same way, right? If we made a machine that could make food at the press of a button and we could just feed people by pressing a button um, and they would no longer be hungry, that, that, that even if that machine cost a trillion dollars to make, that starvation would not be ethically justifiable, right? Um, software is like that, right? Like other information goods. Once we make it, everyone everywhere can have it. And so the question then becomes, what, what is the ethical justification for depriving people of software in a world where everyone can have it? And, and Eben's answer and my answer, and I think our movement's answer is, there is no ethical justification for depriving people of something which everyone everywhere could have for the same cost that anyone could have it. Um, uh, we can't justify scarcity in an information good or in software. So that's access, and that's very important. Um, but then, and of course, you can see these things uh, in the free software definition. But the second issue is, in many ways, the thing that has motivated me even more. And as you may have been able to tell, I was pretty motivated by the sharing and access bit as well. Um, uh, the second bit really comes down to um, uh, what I'm going to talk about today in terms of empowerment, but a lot of people talk about it in terms of autonomy, a lot of people talk about it in, in terms of control. There's a, um, the GNU Manifesto says control over one's ideas really constitutes control over other people's lives, and it's usually used to make their lives more difficult, a cynical perspective perhaps. Um, but the idea comes down to the idea that everyone should be able to change their software um, because, um, uh, uh, because through that process they, are, they, are, they gain control over their own lives and they, begin, and, and they gain power. They are empowered. I, when I talk about this, and if you've heard me give talks at Libra Planet before, or maybe almost anywhere else, you've heard me give the same example, um, uh, but I really like this. I often use my phone as a way to communicate, especially to people outside this room, but I think it will be useful here as well to explain why free software is fundamentally important to me. And I can say that, that you know, my, my phone, like all of your phone, has software. Um, uh, quite a lot of software, and it does a lot of things. And the things that my phone does has an important impact on me and the messages in which I can communicate. So if I can send a, if my phone allows me to send a short message to someone else, um, uh, you know, one of, uh, I may be, I, because I've spent a lot of time on GNU Social or StatusNet or those, those, other, those other ones, uh, those other microblogging systems, I may be very skilled at sending short messages. Um, I may be able to pack a lot of information into 140 characters. If I can, but if I can take a selfie, you know, uh, of everyone here and send it to, uh, I can send, send it to someone, then I can send a very different kind of message, right? Um, I can, if I can call, if I have, my phone has the ability to send voice, I can, I can, you can hear intonation, you can hear certain different kinds of passion. The point is, is that the, 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 the features, right, the functionality of this technology frames the nature of the kinds of messages that I can send, right? And in a much broader sense, all of our technology does this. And to the extent that our lives are increasingly mediated by technology, the question of who controls that technology becomes an enormously important political question because it becomes the question of who controls our experience and understanding of the world and each other, right? Um, I, you know, a lot of my life is mediated by technology. It's my, I sometimes, you know, I look at my laptop and I see my, my, my work, my hobby, and on many days my social life. Um, uh, um, probably uh, we're maybe at some sort of the, the, the beginning of that curve, but I think that this is inc increasingly true more broadly as well. Um, the question of who controls this and this, uh, all of the technology that we use to understand the world is an enormously important political question, right? And free software is an answer to that question. Um, the answer is you, right? Or rather, you, the user of the technology. You 
the, your experience of the world is important to you and control over that experience is important. So you should be able to control your software, right? Because otherwise your software controls you as RMS uh, likes to say. Um, um, and, that's, uh, and that's the other half of the, of the free software mission. Now, um, uh, I will say that lots of other movements have um, been inspired by free software, have used very similar sorts of missions. If you look at the Wikimedia Foundation's mission, they talk about dissemination of information and empowering users um, by spreading access to information about, the, about encyclopedias and by um, encyclopedic information and by encouraging people to transcend their roles as just consumers to become producers. This idea of access and empowerment, these two missions. All right, that's the first chapter. The, the second thing I want to talk, um, uh, uh, what I want to talk about now is sort of how we're doing in terms of those two things. And I'm going to break it down into, in terms of those two twin missions. And as I've already sort of suggested, um, I think that in terms of access, we're doing quite well. So I mean, if, you, if you've been around this community for a long time, you remember that uh, in, the, in the, I don't know, the, the bad old days, maybe the good old days, we would all get excited when people, when Netcraft would release the new uh, set of statistics about web servers um, uh, uh, out there and what proportion of them are using free software. And the reason we were really excited about it is because they were almost all using all free software, almost since the very beginning. As long as statistics have been kept about um, what web servers or uh, web scripting languages are being used, free software has been dominate, uh, dominant. Apache continues to be the most popular. We have now reached the sort of uh, uh, earlier last year, a period where in terms of active web servers, the second most popular web server is also free software. It's Nginx now as well. Um, uh, free software um, has uh, had a majority of market share in these areas for as long as statistics have been kept. Um, browsers are, of course, also largely free or at least connected to um, uh, strongly uh, can be made free relatively easily. Although Internet Explorer once held 95% of market share in browsers um, uh, after it squeezed out Netscape uh, Navigator, which had been released freely, illegally, according to antitrust uh, adjudications in both the US and um, Europe. Uh, browsers like um, uh, Chrome, Chromium, Firefox, Iceweasel, IceCat now hold um, more than half of the market. Recent industry surveys suggest that more than 40% of firms that are involved in, free, in software development of any sort um, contribute to and develop free software as part of their business. Um, uh, we've done very good at spreading, uh, spreading our software out there. If we look at usage shares in terms, of, in terms of operating systems, we see that it's mixed in terms of the types of platform. Uh, the, we're still waiting for our year of GNU Linux on the desktop uh, um, in some ways, uh, but uh, we've been stable at uh, about 1%. But what we see is that in terms of the handhold market, more than half of all of them use operating systems using the Linux kernel. In terms of uh, supercomputers, it's basically all. In terms of um, uh, mainframes and embedded systems, it's somewhere around a third of computers, uh, uh, computers are running software um, that we as a community have produced. Evan Moglin, like five or six years ago, said like in the future, more, most computers are going to be running software that this community has building. And I didn't believe him. I really didn't believe him. Um, but we're very quickly moving towards a situation where that is the case. Lots and lots of people, most people, people like, like not, I used to be able to say who runs, like, who, who runs a, a, a Linux kernel on, on their phone. And I would be the only person in the room who said yes, at least among academics. Now everyone says yes. Um, uh, this is the super, you can see this exponential growth that we've seen. In many cases, the difference between, for example, embedded systems and, um, uh, and uh, smartphones is that we're just at different places along this exponential growth curve, right? Things are continue to, um, we're a little further along in the more technical areas like servers. If you look at, um, uh, if you look at um, the, the very high end, so supercomputers, you can see this exponential growth, which eventually slows down because we basically have all of it. Um, uh, uh, so, so uh, uh, it's too bad uh, that uh, we're limited in that way. If you look at smart, if you look at smartphone operating systems, you see Android, um, which. Uh, of course, now makes a large majority of, uh, or a majority of all, uh, a majority of all uh, uh, smartphone operating systems globally. Uh, a bit smaller in the U.S., uh, um, but but globally looking very good and ascendant. If we look, um, if we think about market share in terms of platforms more broadly, right? So so one thing. So so uh, this is a computer. You uh, may sometimes forget, but this is a computer, right? A computer in your pocket. Uh, pocket. Um, and in, if you look at people's computing platforms, what you see is that 
the Linux kernel is running on near or in uh, according to many statistics most computers that people are using as platforms through which they sort of interact with the world um, largely of course because of uh, largely of course because of Android Windows has it's not that Windows uh, Windows market share of uh, desktop computers has shrunk enormously but um, uh, but free software based systems have expanded in lots of other um, in, in lots of other places on new sort of form factors and new tablets if we look for raw numbers so these numbers here suggest that by the end of by the end of this year there will be somewhere in the order of two billion people with computers running versions of the Linux kernel right a huge portion of like humans on the planet um, free software is moving out there the stuff that we have produced as a community enormously um, this is old data. This is uh, um, uh, this is from 2009. It's actually really hard to get good data on how free on, on how many people are using free software because we sort of give it away in ways that make it sometimes hard to track. Um, when I was working at Canonical, I worked I was part of the team that helped start the Ubuntu project, and people would ask us how many users we had, and I said it was part of my job to be in charge of like building our user community. And I said I have no idea how many users we have. <laughs> um, uh, our best metrics used things like the number of times that people can connected to our time server um, to find out what time it was, and we estimated certainly in the order of tens of millions of users um, uh, by the time I left a couple years into the project, right? Um, just, just in Ubuntu. Um, I personally helped oversee the mailings of millions of CDs with Ubuntu on them. Uh, the company that was producing our CDs made me like one of these like platinum CD things because we had become like one of their best companies. They sent it to my house. I was like, I don't know what to do. I gave it to my parents. I'm like, maybe you want. It's this, uh, 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 it's this big framed like Ubuntu CD. Like you produced this. Uh, thanks for producing so much of this stuff which you gave away to so many people, right? Uh, we've done a lot to move this stuff out. Um, this is downloads just from SourceForge between 2006 and 2009. And you can see we're sort of at the end of this period of growth. Uh, we've reached everyone, uh, um, and this is monthly downloads, and we're looking at something in the order of 50 million downloads per month, just from SourceForge, um, during this period between 2006 to 2009. Um, it's gone down a bit because people have moved away from SourceForge over time, although I actually was not able to get data um, after this. Of course, um, uh, it's hard to track in this area. If we look at places like Wikipedia, where we can track it, we see that we, um, uh, where we can track unique users, we see that the number of unique users is tracking in many cases because our stuff is available online you know, um, at no cost, gratis, we've seen things that track the growth of the internet in many cases, and there's lots of indications that free software is on a, sim is on a similar path, right? Um, there's about half a billion people a month who go to Wikipedia for information, sort of different people. Um, we're doing really well in terms of getting our stuff out there. Lots of people have this stuff and can share it freely with other people. Um, and this is a very important piece, of, um, uh, uh, a very important a successful step that we have been able to take as a movement. But again, that's only half our mission. In terms of empowerment, I want to suggest that we've done, that, that, that change and reuse, the ability to change and reuse, and also, of course, the uh, people actually taking advantage of that freedom to change and reuse is far less universal. This is the number of, uh, this is uh, using that same data set from SourceForge. This is looking at the number of uh, active, sort of not active, of developers on all projects. And this is like the most, uh, um, the opposite of a conservative measure. This is counting every, num summing up the number of developers across all projects, which means that this is assuming that no person on SourceForge has ever like works on more than one project, which uh, I can tell you in my case is not true. Um, uh, this is also assuming that no one is ever inactive on SourceForge, right? Like, like, um, uh, uh, which I can tell you is not true. Um, uh, we're st um, if those things were true, we would see still somewhere in the order of a few hundred, a couple hundred downloads. You can see the scale is very different here. A couple hundred downloads per month during the same period um, per user who has ever, you know, double counted user who has ever participated, right? Um, there's a lot more people who are using this stuff, even in the context of a place like SourceForge, um, than there are people who, who are producing it. And that has always been the, ca uh, been the case. If you saw my talk a couple years ago on, um, why, on, on how free software isn't better, practically better, then um, you saw a hint of the way in which this works. This is, of course, cumulative, so the growth here is, um, is capturing the fact that we're adding about, this SourceForge was during the same period, adding about 3,000 new 
contributors to projects. Again, double counting people over time. Um, the community was small and not growing very much. The community of producers, while the number of people consuming it was um, uh, continued to move very robustly. Of course, we've moved on in lots of ways. GitHub now has more than nine million users as of what their website told me last night. Um, but of course, that includes proprietary software developers. A lot of people who use GitHub um, are using it to develop proprietary software. Um, and it also, um, uh, and it, uh, um, um, and, 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 uh, but, but I think it suggests something which is definitely true, which is that our community of developers, in terms of the absolute numbers, has grown. And it has enormously, right? It's, of course, very difficult to get good viewership data from uh, GitHub because, unlike SourceForge, people tend to not download, they, they tend to not get their, uh, people that are using GitHub projects very often don't get them from GitHub. So you may write a, an Android app, but most people will download them from a, from a, from a place like Ftroid, but probably not Ftroid, <laughs> probably the Google Play Store, very unfortunately. Um, uh, the rapid growth of free software, as we saw before, suggests, as I've said, that somewhere near two billion people will be using Android um, or other sort of Linux kernel-based systems by the, by the end of this year. And yet, um, uh, be, uh, for that reason, we don't have to speculate about questions about, um, about, about empowerment, right? Because if all of the people who are using free software, the stuff that our communities are producing, are using it in Android, they are almost all very systematically using it on devices which do not put them in a position where they even could take advantage of their freedoms to, uh, of, of, of their freedoms to change that software. Um, um, for, for, for practical reasons, some of them more stark than others. Um, for one, a large majority of these devices, these Android, uh, these Android devices and tablets and uh, similar, um, and phones, are locked down in a way that keep people from being able to change the software. Right. Um, uh, even if you may have access or be able to get access to a large amount of the source code that for the software that runs on your device, but good luck trying to, you know, and you may even be able to change it. Um, uh, but get, but once you have it, good luck putting it on the device. But of course, if you, all you have is is this device, which is of course the majority of these um, people who have these phones, they don't have computers. They're in a worse position because of course, in order to change the software, if you walk into a Google office or a place where people are doing Android development, you'll see not a bunch of people sitting around in phones, but a bunch of people sitting around in front of laptops, right? Um, uh, that in order to, uh, that, 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 that generally speaking, the devices which run the free software operating systems that most people have are not devices that even can change. Um, along, in, in a couple different ways, the software that exists on them, right? Um, I know that the vast majority of these people are not empowered in terms of the way in which we talk about empowerment because they can't be. Um, uh, we see similar sorts of things in places where the data is a little bit better. So again, remember Wikipedia data, data is, is relatively, um, is, is much better. Um, we see that over this period in which Wikipedia has grown, in, um, uh, has essentially doubled in terms of its readership size from somewhere around 200 million uh, uh, unique viewers per month to somewhere in the order of 500 million, we see that the readership, the, uh, the editorship, which has been more or less constant over this period, has shrunk. Um, uh, to, um, uh, sorry, has shrunk slightly. But even if it were completely the same, we would still see a move from a situation in which about one, from, we went from a situation in which one in 3,000 uh, readers of Wikipedia were involved in editing to a situation in which maybe one in 5,000 users um, uh, of the site are involved in editing in some ways. And for lots of reasons, there's, uh, we have lots of reasons to believe that Wikipedia is going to be much better at this than we are because, of course, the barriers to entry along, along lots of dimensions, this, the technical skills that are necessary are much lower to contribute to a Wikipedia article than they are to contribute to almost any free software project. Certainly in a technical capacity, but probably more broadly as well. So that brings us to the, uh, the next chapter, which is sort of thinking systematically about why this has been so hard. Because for me, uh, this is a problem. I mean, we've made enormous uh, inroads um, in terms of both access and empowerment. There are more, I don't know, there are more people at Libre Planet this year than there were last year. I don't know. But yes. Uh, yes. Um, um, and there are certainly more people within our broader movement and community than there ever were before. The numbers are monotonically increasing. But the, but, 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 the, but the problem, and this is, I suppose, in some ways a very nice problem to have, is that the number of people who are using our stuff has been going up much, much faster than the number of people who are contributing to and, and, and building it, right? Or who are sort of in the ways that we think are important, even empowered to do that, right? And there's a lot of reasons why um, uh, um, that I've been able to come with. I've been able to come up with five reasons why systematically this has been the case. The first, um, uh, and I'm going to wa walk through each of these at, uh, one at a time. 
The first is, in some ways, I think the most defensible, and it's just the idea that access has to come before empowerment, right? Um, that in order to, that you sort of need to know about uh, free software and you need to have it before you can change it. Um, um, and so as a result, a lot of our advocacy, especially in the very early days um, of our movement, has focused a lot on sort of getting people access to the, te to the technology um, in general. Um, uh, who here has been to, uh, who here first installed GNU Linux on their, on their system at an install party? Uh, was it me? Maybe. Uh, one person. Who here has run an install party or been to one? Someone? Okay, a larger group of people. I've definitely run uh, install parties and participated in them. This has been an important uh, sort of mode of advocacy. The um, GNU Linux user group in Seattle, where I live right now, runs these install parties rel relatively regularly, and people come in and install, um, and install GNU Linux on their computers. This is a picture from one in Russia, in Stavropol, um, uh, and, uh, and, and they're very effective forms of outreach and something which has been an important piece in our toolbox. Um, for the most part, the hack on and change your software parties have been less frequent. Um, um, not, not I, I, I participated in and helped organize my very first hack on and contribute to free software party this year. Um, um, but, but, but I don't think I had ever heard of one before, uh, before two or three years ago. We have, we have tended to privilege this kind of outreach, outreach where the goal is to get people using our stuff as opposed to taking the next step and participating. And very often we haven't followed up. Um, uh, is this, this is, uh, is Bob Murphy here? Someone here? Oh, you are. There, there you are. I put your picture on here. I was, uh, uh, yeah, so this is, a. Uh, I figured you would be because I found someone wearing a free software, free society shirt and I figured they'd probably be here. Um, so this is, uh, Bob Murphy and Sam Sandus from NJ Lug, uh, at the last software freedom day, um, handing out CDs and pamphlets about free software, spreading the word. I have done this on free software, uh, days here in Boston. Um, lots of us I'm sure have in various ways gone out there and tried to spread the word about free software and also to spread the software itself by handing out certainly, uh, um, GNU Linux distributions, but also CDs that contain you know, like, like the open CD or other sort of um, places, CDs that contain free software that people can use on whatever operating system they happen to be using right now, right? This kind of outreach has been another very important piece in our toolbox, a different thing, but a way of sort of getting our stuff out there. It has, it has been a very important part of how we have promoted free software and promoted access. But we have, but, but in these kinds of contexts, it is very hard systematically to necessarily follow up with people in ways that allow us to then talk about how they might contribute or how they could contribute in a way that is more than just theoretic, uh, theoretical. Um, this is the kind of thing that, um, uh, th these are valuable forms of outreach. They're things, they are necessary first steps. Um, but very often we have stopped at that first step. People know, this is, uh, people know of getfirefox.com. This is geticeweasel.com, which is the Debian version of Firefox, which is, addresses we, uh, some of the issues with the trademark, which RMS talked about yesterday in his opening, uh, opening talk. Um, uh, getfirefox.com was, of course, very popular. Um, um, uh, hackfirefox.com, if it exists, uh, is not, at, or whatever it's named, is not nearly as popular. Um, we've done much better. Um, we've, we have focused on this first step of promoting access because it is important and prerequisite and for the most part not followed up. All right, that's the first idea. The second, the, 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 the second reason why we've, um, why, why access, why the, why the work on access seems to be going much better than, than uh, the work on empowerment comes down to what I'm calling, uh, uh, what I call social trade-offs, but very often sort of social and, and uh, subtle and uh, subtle social compromises. Um, I've done, a, this is, this will uh, bear me as I move back into my academic world. I've done a bunch of work in an online community called Scratch, which is a, a programming a platform where kids can use, kids use to learn to program, but it's also a place where kids can share their programs with others. Every program shared within the Scratch online community is free software, in the sense that every program in Scratch is released under a free license which allows the four freedoms and the two twin sort of freedoms as I've talked about them here. What, um, what we found, um, one of the things that we found is that in Scratch very, very infrequently do users of the site really take advantage of that freedom in the sense that they go in and remix each other's projects, that they go in and uh, become involved in changing the software that they're using, even though they all can, not unlike what I've suggested is the case in the broader free software movement. And so I've looked at why that is, and in particular I've looked at when that isn't. I've looked at what quality 
qualities of free software, uh, what qualities of projects, free software projects, in the context of the Scratch Online community are the ones that are likely to attract more of this kind of engagement, that are more likely to be remixed. I'm calling that generativity. And I have a set of hypotheses here. I tested this um, using data from the online community. And what I found was that there were a series of qualities. It's not super important what they are um, right here, but there are, there are a series of things that, you know, author status and cumulativeness, which means sort of how many other people have worked on it, um, that are associated with uh, increased generativity. But what I found um, um, in doing this research, and you can look this up, the Remixing Dilemma is the name of the paper if you want to look up this work, and there's a blog post about it as well, um, was that all of the qualities that were associated with, with increased engagement, right, increased sort of exercise of empowerment in this context, were also associated with sort of cheaper and less uh, original forms of work. That basically the kinds of things that as a community we could do to attract more contributors, or that the system could do, tended to attract people that were less invested and less motivated in doing so. We found that, that projects that were more likely to be remixed were moderately com complicated, tended to be created by these sort of famous people within the community, and tended to be cumulative. But that each of these factors was also um, associated with less original forms of remixing. The, 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 the takeaway here, or the broader takeaway here, is that these, uh, is that, 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 there was a, that there is a deep sort of trade-off in many cases between the kinds of things we could do to attract more people in general and the kinds of things we would do that would attract the people who were more interested or able to get engaged. That if all we would all want to do, that if all you want to do is optimize for getting more people in the door, um, that the people who come through the door are less committed um, uh, because perhaps you've spent less time convincing them to become committed. Um, or less committed because they didn't really ever care that much to, um, uh, about um, engaging deeply in the first place. That there are deep sort of social trade-offs that are ones that for the most part in our advocacy and outreach we have not tried to take into account or address. There are also technological compromises um, uh, th th that we make, which are related, but in some cases, uh, uh, um, but in some cases, much stronger. So the, the the closest one, which is like like hardly even a compromise, is this idea of Tivoization, right? This is I've already alluded to this in terms of these uh, in terms of talking about Android devices. Um, uh, this is the most extreme version because freedom is simply compromised in the sense like like in the sense that it's just completely made impossible. Um, that software that is free that is produced by our community is even in some cases under previous versions of the GP. Um, things which were addressed in the revision of the GPLv3, which is all, why you should all be using it, um, uh, uh, um, that stuff is made unfree. The TiVo, TiVoization, if you know the term, it's the, used to describe what TiVo did, which was take GPLv2 software and lock it up by uh, essentially using encryption to keep people from changing the software on their devices. Sure, you have the source code, but good luck trying to install that back on, onto your device, right? This kind of model, although TiVo pioneered it, uh, pioneered that they are, is now, um, uh, um, is, is now very commonplace. Um, there's a pile of devices, um, uh, almost all of which are unfree in the sense that they run free software, um, or at least significant pieces of free software, but are systematically made unfree by taking, um, users, uh, by taking users' ability to change those devices away from them. Now, um, in this sense, our success in terms of that growth curve um, has come at an enormous cost. Our success at promoting access to the stuff that we're producing and people's ability to share their software has come in many cases at the cost of, um, at the, at the, cost of the technology. And very often these, things, uh, these distinctions are very stark. Another example from Wikipedia is one that shows how even when we're acting in ways that I think are very well intentioned, um, we, can, we can build these kinds of compromises in. Are people familiar with the Wikipedia Zero project? Um, it's very cool. It's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a project launched by the Wikimedia Foundation to make deals with mobile phone operators around the world to essentially, uh, uh, to essentially uh, say that people will be able to access Wikipedia for free from their devices, um, but only from their mobile devices. And this is great because lots of people around the world through this process begin to have access to um, you know, free information, free in our sense of freedom. Um, but when Wikipedia Zero launched, there was no way to contribute to Wikipedia from your mobile phone. Um, um, it was a harder technical problem. And, and, and we made a compromise um, as a community, we, the Wikimedia community, in terms of promoting access at the expense um, of, of, of the proportion of those users that would or even could become empowered in this sense. 
there are what I call second order digital divides. Um, so the digital divide, the first one is of course some people don't have access to computers, some people do. Even within people who have access, you very often see things like skills gaps, right? Um, there's um, been some really interesting work by uh, Esther Hargitay and uh, Aaron Shaw at Northwestern University that has looked at the gender gap within Wikipedia. They, like the Wikipedia community, like our community, has, uh, has really struggled uh, um, to, in, to engage more women in the production of the material on their website. And, uh, but one thing they've found and people have done research is that if you, for example, go out and survey lots of um, internet users, and you'll find, of course, that lots of those internet users are, um, uh, some of those internet users are contributors to Wikipedians, and that of the contributors to Wikipedians, they tend to be overwhelmingly male. I'm sure that if the, they didn't ask about free software, I'm sure that if they did, they would find something similar. But one thing they find is that a huge portion of the, dis of the, of the disparity um, that is often described of, uh, that's, that, that's referred to very often as the gender gap, um, comes down to a skills gap as well. They can explain a lot of that variation. That very often, uh, that, that very often, lots of people just don't have the technical skills even to contribute to Wikipedia, right? And that systematically, unless we address that inequality, um, these, 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 these broader forms of inequality or sort of correlated forms of inequality are things that we're going to have to deal with. And to the extent that most people um, don't have the skills to contribute to free software, um, th those people will never become empowered in the sense of being able to directly engage in the, in the contributions to uh, our community and our, uh, and, and our software. The final thing comes down to what I call project life cycles. And project li life cycles just means that uh, the, the idea that, that as our projects have become more successful and matured, we've changed in different ways. This is a list of the subscribers to the Debian private mailing list. It's not exactly a list of the total number of Debian developers, but it's probably pretty, pretty close. And what it shows is something which I think matches uh, my intuition. And um, uh, Zach and I talked yesterday, and we think it seems about right as well, which is that uh, there was rapid growth um, up through 2008. You can see that Debian turned off its, the process by which people, which people became new maintainers briefly in 2009 or so, and then turned it back on and uh, grew very rapidly again, and then stabilized. And Debian is, of course, an older example and more successful example of a free software project, but it's one that has moved into a different stage in its life cycle, like many of our projects. Very often, as our projects become more mature and successful, we, we, be, they become, we begin to move into a, a situation where we're doing bug fixing and where we care more about quality, perhaps, than we did before. Um, um, and as a result, it become, um, and we move into a situation where we have larger code bases. And through that process, it becomes systematically more difficult for newcomers to join. Um, because it's more complicated. There's more stuff. There's more rules. Um, there's more people. It's actually just harder to become a Debian developer. Back at the early side of this graph, you had to send an email to one person and say, I would like to become a Debian developer. That's what I did. Um, uh, uh, but of course, uh, it's more difficult now. Now you have to answer questions for like weeks um, or months in order to do it, right? And this is a sort of common um, process here as well. All right. So in the final few minutes, I want to talk a little bit about what it is I think we should do here. And, I can, and I'm going to suggest that there are sort of three classes of options. The first, of course, is that we could do nothing. Um, uh, and you might be able to guess based on the rest of my talk, that's not what I'm going to suggest we should do. But I think that the answer is not as obviously wrong as maybe the uh, earlier version of my talk suggested, and I think it's worth addressing. I believe, I, I, I realize, believe me, I do, that empowerment does not mean that everyone has to be a programmer. Um, um, after all, freedom of the press and other important freedom does not mean that everyone needs to run a newspaper, right? Um, or a television station. Um, uh, and the GNU Manifesto in, uh, also suggests um, in ways that I believe that even if you can't program, you might be able to hire someone, for example, to program for you. And that is a, a real thing that people can do. The important thing, after all, is not that everyone needs to be hacking on software, but that everyone sort of has the freedom to do it. But it's hard to, it would be hard for me to believe that I lived in a country with a free press if there were no independent newspapers. Um, or maybe only a few run by certain kinds of people, people that were sort of systematically different than the rest of the population, wealthier, in developing countries, um, uh, male, so on and so forth, right? Um, I think, I often think of this in terms of, in, in, in sort of in terms of writing, uh, or I think of programming in terms of writing, um, or sort of taking control as a form of literac literacy. Most users of, uh, um, uh, because I think that like, we, it's important, we, we teach people to read, not because we want everyone to become a, sorry, we teach everyone to write, not because we want everyone to become a journalist, right? But because we think that learning to write is an important way through which people can sort of gain a skill which is in itself empowering, and that they could, by learning, though, taking those first steps, um, know, they will know enough to sort of transcend that 
position as just a consumer, right? And that's something which in the case of software we haven't done as much. I think that, I think that software is, um, imagine a world in which everyone knew how to read, but no one knew how to, only a few people knew how to write. Um, Imagine a world in which everyone used software, but only a few people knew that uh, they could change it or how to change it. And I, think that, um, uh, and I think that we're in a similar situation in terms of software as well, and so I think it is important to not do nothing. Um, uh, what, we can, what we can do is, um, uh, uh, another thing we can do is, is compromise. Um, and what compromising means is that sometimes we may simply have to choose between access or empowerment. And I think that we, and I think that, uh, that you know, we can do, we, we, and, and this can happen in lots of ways. For example, we might have to sacrifice efficiency by dealing with newcomers, right? I sometimes say that like GNU is like the least efficient operating system like ever produced, right? I have to spend all of this time like arguing with random people over obviously correct things, obvious of course to me. Um, uh, uh, and if you disagree with me, you're obviously wrong, right? Um, but this process through which we sort of negotiate this as a community is something which um, um, can take time and dealing with more people and bringing more people in will mean that we have to, uh, that we may have to become less efficient at feature development than we could be otherwise. But the, but the benefit of that, um, of paying that cost, is empowering a, a large number of people, welcoming more people with, um, within our community. The third thing we can do is, re is remove systematic uh, barriers to participation. We can, wake we can work to make our projects systematically more accessible to newcomers. Um, uh, and there are lots of ways in which, in, in which that can happen. Um, I'm super pleased by the anti-harassment policy that this conference has and that lots of others do as well because the reality is, is that there are, there, there are harassment as a type of systematic barrier that tends to, that, that, that keeps lots of people away from our community. There are certain norms in which, in, in which the, in, that, have, that describe the way in which we have worked and interacted with each other in the past which are systematically keeping people out. Um, money is a big one. Uh, is, is another big one. Um, the reality is, is that I'm sure many of you, like me, um, had, you know, did this recreational software development, which is like a weird hobby. You try to explain that to people. Um, try to explain that to my parents, that this is fun and that um, I'm doing it. But, uh, um, but, 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 but I've never taken a computer science class. I do this stuff. I hack on this stuff because I love it. But I've been privileged to be in a position where I was able to be supported. I, had, I didn't have to work when I was in high school. I was able to spend time hacking on stuff. And most people don't have that privilege. And so efforts to systematically go out to communities of people where they are not able to hack on software as a hobby because they're too busy having to make money and support those people is an important way in which we can remove another systematic barrier. Uh, I have two threes, I now realize. The fourth, uh, the fourth uh, but numbered three, uh, uh, <laughs> pretend we started counting at zero. Uh, um, uh, most important thing we can do is education. And I've been working on this in a variety of spaces, and I think that it is actually the single most important thing we can do. I think that perhaps what, what, uh, the most important thing we can do as a free software community to promote empowerment is to systematically think about how we can do not just programming um, uh, education, but, but, uh, but certainly programming education, but also sort of um, programming education in the context of free software. I, have, um, I was very inspired by the Boston Python workshops organized by a number of people, probably a number of people in this room, uh, um, which taught uh, hundreds of women and their friends in the Boston area how to program in Python. I have built on a version of this curriculum. It's called the Community Data Science Workshops. We, are, uh, we have taught several hundred people over the last year how to program in Python and how to sort of uh, change their software and use software and data in the world around them to sort of to, to demystify the, the, the process of programming. My goal here, and in all of my work, is not to teach people to become programmers. If you want a job as a programmer, you should take a programming class, you know, a real programming class. My goal is to demystify the access of programming so that, so, so that, so that people can just take that step from being the kind of person who uses software that is written for them and who realizes that they can, uh, that they can change it, who can make small changes and who can feels comfortable going out and hiring someone to make a change in the ways that the GNU Manifesto suggests that they might be able to do. Um, uh, uh, three weekends is enough to get people towards that, um, to, 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 to move people towards that step, but it's something which is very different than the kind of advocacy that we've done before. Um, Open Hatch, I want to give a shout out to, has been doing fantastic, fantastic work. Um, the organization that I, uh, that I the, the sort of, uh, Hack Fest on free software that I helped organize used a lot of curriculum that used the curriculum that Open Hatch has built. Um, uh, they are actively working out there and teaching people who are already users of free software how to contribute. 
Um, they are showing them Git. They are showing them. Uh, they are showing them the uh, some of the, the the tools and social processes that they need to use. They are talking about mailing lists and ways in which these communities communicate. Our communities, these communities, um, and they are bringing more people in. We can do better. Um, I had a really uh, inspiring conversation yesterday with Walter Bender, who of course is at Sugar Labs. I don't know if he gave, he's given talks here many years before. Um, uh, and uh, um, he told me something really fantastic because Sugar, of course, Sugar is the project which uh, was uh, sort of comes from this tradition that started with one laptop per child, and it's an interface and a way of using a computer and running applications that is designed with a lot of these principles in mind, with the idea that every user of the system should be or should be able to become a developer of the system. The, uh, this is a programming project where users can, uh, in turtle art, where users can sort of write their own programs using these blocks that snap together. But one thing that Turtle Art and some other programs within uh, Sugar have really taken seriously is this idea of the view source button, right? The view source button that's not just the thing you see on the web, but that allows you to see the source of the applications that you're working on. So that when something's not working the way you want, you have in this very exposed way asked the ability to change it. And of course you can do that and you can see the Python code that runs the program. Um, what inspired me was that Walter said that in the latest version of Sugar, more than half of the patches that went into the software came from kids, kids that were using this piece of educational software. If we start and design our stuff from scratch, if we take, make empowerment the, a, a goal that is as equal in our actions as it is in our <coughs> principles, um, we can make real progress on this. I think that we've done fantastic in terms of the first half of our mission, and I look forward to the next 30 years where we can make similar progress on the rest. So, um, uh, you know, the work of people in this room is really important. I think that what's at stake here is much more than just the, the individual projects that we work on. What's at stake is empowerment and people's control over their experience of the world. I think that there are a few people working on projects that are as important as the ones that, that you are, and I thank you all for letting me be a small part of it.